Professor Haugen is uh, teaching out here for a week doing an intensive human rights course and we decided to open up one of the sessions to, um, to the community, to our law school community and just allow those who are interested and would like a chance to uh, hear Professor Haugen while he's on campus, be able to share a bit. And um, so you'll find that we're jumping in in the middle of class, but we also tried to pick a day that was, had material that uh, could, was accessible and you could enter and um, interact with. So most of the class, the, those who are taking the course in the first couple rows, and we're reserving some questions and some discussion for them. But we also want to encourage you to hopefully there might be there might be some time after the course to ask questions. And so thank you for all coming out here. And um, want to introduce uh, real briefly, let me get to teaching class. Uh, Gary Haugen, who's the founder and CEO of IJM. He worked for. Um, uh, the U.S. government uh, in, uh, with uh, police brutality prosecutions and then worked for the United Nations in Rwanda during the genocide or immediately after the genocide and has just had an amazing career and from there um, felt the call and desire to go and start something bigger that served the poor around the world and um, started the International Justice Mission and uh, you know, for many of us for me, that's an organization that has been a big inspiration in showing what lawyers could do, what's possible with a law degree, and uh, just encouraging, I think, all of us in our careers and this fight for justice and really giving that some special application. So it's a real privilege that we get to have someone who's truly one of the leaders in this field and setting the bar. And I think there's really no other organization out there like IJM or as admired as IJM that is doing this good work. And um, Professor Haugen is here with his family. They're staying down by the beach for the week, so it is a special privilege that we get to have them for this intensive course in this, this week. So I'll turn it over to you. Please welcome Gary Haugen. Well, thank you all. And uh, thank you, Jay, for the introduction. And um, thanks for the chance to get to be here with, with you. Let me give you just a, a little bit of context for where we are in the course so we can sort of bring everyone along together. We are really looking at the, the endeavor of the last half century around the great enterprise of international human rights, but particularly asking the question, how well does that movement serve the average poor person in the developing world? So we're interested uh, as law students at looking at this very extraordinary historic phenomenon of the international human rights movement, the development of international human rights law, uh, the development of institutions that would actually try to bring enforcement of that law, uh, those, those set of mechanisms, and then also ask, well, how well uh, does that movement serve the people who live in poverty in the world? Uh, because it turns out there are a lot of those people and we'd be very interested to know uh, how uh, sort of the dream and aspiration of human rights serves the poorest in the world. Uh, so first of all, we uh, began by just looking at the extent of uh, poverty in the world uh, and talked a little bit about the good news, bad news situation. This slide sort of shows the good news of the struggle against poverty. There's a lot less as a percentage matter uh, but as in absolute numbers, there are still massive numbers of people who live in very, very desperate poverty. So that means there are a, about a million and a half people who live on about a dollar and a half a day. Uh, I mean, about a, about a billion, about a billion people, and then about two and a half billion who live off two dollars or so a day. Both are levels of just very extreme and very difficult uh, poverty. And they are, of course, located in uh, overwhelmingly in the developing world. Uh, and so then we talked uh, about the, the lives of, of a few very specific um, citizens of those countries and looked at individual cases of abuse because we were looking at five different categories of violent abuse that afflict uh, the poor. And uh, those uh, categories were, uh, first of all, gender and sexual violence. Um, which is, uh, accounts actually, according to the World Health Organization, for more ill health uh, 
than cancer, automobile accidents, and malaria combined in the world. So as just a public health matter, the problem of violence against women and girls is an overwhelming phenomenon that afflicts hundreds of millions of people. So that's the first and most pervasive and most devastating form of violence amongst the poor is uh, gender violence, especially sexual violence. Uh, for this, we talked about uh, Louisa in uh, Guatemala, who was just sexually assaulted by a man in uh, her neighborhood. We talked about a young girl that I was with in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in Peru, actually with her mother, because this eight-year-old girl was uh, uh, raped and, and murdered, uh, and her body just left out in the street. Um, we talked about uh, a, a girl in a slum in Kenya who was raped three, by, by three different men just in her slum neighborhood. Uh, we talked a bit about Kunti on the lower right there, who's um, from Cambodia, who's uh, uh, sold into a brothel and just raped uh, many, many times a day. So sex trafficking specifically is a form of sexual violence that's actually a business. That people actually organize a business of abduction and assault, imprisonment, and rape um, as a way of actually making money. And there are millions of children who end up being victimized by that. But they're overwhelmingly uh, among the poorest. So um, sexual uh, violence and gender violence, the number one most pervasive, massive form of violence that afflicts the poor. Uh, the, the second uh, form of violence is forced labor. Uh, it's estimated that there are about 27 million people who are held in slavery in the world today. And we looked at Kumar, uh, who's a slave in, in India. Um, there are more people held in slavery today than were taken or extracted from Africa during 400 years of the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, in our era, there is a smaller percentage of human beings than, than at any time held in slavery, but a, a larger absolute number of human beings held in slavery than any other time in human history. So forced labor would be the, uh, the, the second category. Uh, the third category would be uh, police abuse. Uh, for the poor, probably the most pervasive criminal element in their own lives is their own police. Uh, who end up extracting actually more money from them than perhaps any other element in their uh, society. Uh, fourth, a form of, of violence against the poor is illegal detention. So that if you go into the developing world and if you were to visit the prisons and jails, you would find somewhere between 60 and 85 percent of the prisoners have never been convicted or charged with a crime. Uh, the fifth form of violence uh, would be illegal land seizure. Uh, violent theft of other people's land, especially uh, poor people. Uh, Veronica's story is typical um, from Uganda. Uh, she's widowed and trying to take care of uh, herself and some other family members, but without the man who is the, tr the uh, traditional protector of the family's rights in property, uh, more powerful family members or community members will come and steal the land. Uh, in Africa, at least, uh, somewhere between 40 to 50 percent of widows uh, are threatened with uh, the violent expropriation of their, of their land. So, so this is the context. Um, all of these violations represent very fundamental and brutal violations of people's most basic human rights. So then the question is, how has this great enterprise of international human rights served um, the, the poorest? And so we talked a little bit about this uh, revolution of uh, international human rights, and maybe one of my uh, students will just give us uh, a sense of, of what was so extraordinary about the second half of the 20th century in terms of the international human rights movement, what was sort of fundamentally, from a historical perspective, so extraordinary about the um, international human rights effort. What was it trying to do? What, did it, what problem was it trying to solve? Yes, Ms. Nathan. Well, since sort of like the beginning of time, I think all countries um, kind of operated under this premise that they had sovereignty over the people in their 
you know, territory and other countries had no right to dictate what they did or didn't do or how they treated them. Um, and then after the atrocities of World War II, there became uh, just a growing international consensus that we needed to lay down some parameters on how you know, the rights that every single human being has, not that are given by the state, but that just are you know, in a, inalienable because you're a human. So um, the UN was formed and um, laid down some declarations of what those human rights are, and they're just aspirational principles that you know, had really no like, um, inherent authority, but by adoption, states around the world have now you know, added them to their own laws, and that's how they're getting enforced. So the major fundamental shift was that now countries are you know, adopting these international norms, whereas for most of history, there was absolutely no international norm on how people should be treated. Excellent. So, you know, the whole invention of law itself is fantastic, right? I mean, where does that actually even come from? And where does its legitimacy um, flow from? And so this notion that you could set up interna a body of law, international human rights law, that was something that was invented in the second half of the 20th century. And so then we talked about where the legitimacy for that came, but then also well, what are the uh, mechanisms of enforcement? And we talked a little bit um, about the, the UN system, the regional uh, human rights uh, forums that attempt to try to bring about enforcement of these um, norms. But we also talked very briefly about the fact that these mechanisms really were not going to provide the average poor person with a venue to find vindication of their rights. If any one of these individuals is raped or imprisoned or assaulted um, or has their land stolen, they're not all going to make their way to an international human rights uh, forum. So what is the idea by which those rights would actually trickle down? Uh, well, it, it seems from the history of it that the assumption would be that you would carry out a effort to embed those international norms into your national law. So this was sort of the second phase of the international human rights movement was first of all articulating those international norms um, and uh, articulating them in a series of uh, treaties or conventions that people sign on to and say, we believe these are universally applicable to all human beings just by nature of their being human. And then individual countries went through periods of political struggle to actually embed those norms into their national law. So we looked at the way that India uh, came to make forced labor illegal in the 1970s or the way women won the right to inherit property in, um, in Africa, or regulations on the state's power to detain you uh, went through a period of um, revision in Latin America, or uh, laws that would uh, address the, the problem of, of sex trafficking in Cambodia. Uh, th these individual countries began adopting into their national law these international norms with the idea, it's pretty obvious, that the way the average citizen then would get vindication of their, their universal rights would be through local law enforcement, the national law enforcement system. So that these rights that are provided that everyone gets because they're human gets embedded in national law. And so now the mechanism by which that law is, uh, is enforced then becomes the, the, the means or the vehicle by which someone gets their um, rights vindicated. But here's where we ran into the problem which we're taking up now, uh, and that is to look with how well do those systems actually work. Uh, and what we've been uh, examining really in these individual cases uh, is the, the brokenness of uh, public justice systems in the developing world. And this is a very large problem, right? Because if your hope is that these international norms are going to get embedded in national law, and then national law is going to be enforced, but if the enforcement system does not work, then it becomes meaningless to have uh, these rights articulated. So we talked um, 
um, about each one of these cases a bit. Looking at Kunti's case, a case of forced uh, prostitution in, um, uh, in Cambodia, which has fantastic law now uh, to address sex trafficking. But in Kunti's case, of course, the police have been, are being actually paid uh, by the local commercial uh, sex uh, operator to not enforce the law. So while the local police officer may be paid a salary by the public to enforce the law, that salary may be like this, and in Cambodia, a police officer might be paid $30, $40 a month. Uh, so it doesn't take very much uh, to be able to actually uh, exceed that salary. Uh, so the brothel keeper is actually able to pay the, the police officer more not to enforce the law. And uh, when you have these large illicit trades, you will actually see law enforcement completely subverted in terms of an entire market that pays law enforcement not to operate. Also in, uh, in Cambodia, in Kunti's case, you would have... Um, uh, an example of not only a lack of, of will to enforce the law because there's a subversion of corruption and uh, also a cultural subversion of, of this um, uh, will to enforce the law because Kunti is a, a, a girl and in, uh, in that culture she'd be, uh, her concerns would receive less uh, of a priority. Also she uh, is likely to, to be Vietnamese, and so she's also not regarded, she's regarded as a second class citizen within um, Vietnam. Um, but also, so even if there, there isn't the, the will, many times there isn't the capacity to enforce the law, because a Cambodian police officer, I think the first uh, training academy for a Cambodian police officer was established about two, maybe three years ago. Prior to that, there was no training academy in which you would actually go and be trained to be a police officer. You were basically a friend of a friend, picked up the street, put in a police uniform, and boom, you're now a police officer. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about police training in India, for instance. Uh, but even if they wanted to do an effective law enforcement action to release Kunti and to vindicate her rights, they may lack the training and resources to actually do that. Uh, David's case on the top right, he's a, a victim of uh, police abuse. He's picked up uh, by the police. They extract a bribe from him. They end up, actually end up shooting his arm off. Um, there's a, uh, another story that uh, uh, we'll just move qu quickly through, but it's from Kenya, and it also just exemplifies the way that police investigation is done in the developing world. Um, most of it, the standard procedure of uh, police investigation is actually more by torture than by anything else. That is to say, you round up a, a group of folks who are, you suspect of the crime, and then you just start smacking them, and then you find somebody who will confess. And that this is just a regular um, procedure. This is how police proceed in, in trying to do police investigation. Uh, Alina um, uh, was uh, uh, sexually assaulted by the um, uh, chief of police in her town, and her case also uh, exposes some other difficulties in the public justice system, uh, not only in the policing aspect, and um, I had a little uh, drawing of that. When we talk about the public justice system, we think of it as a as a delivery vehicle, it has to deliver enforcement of the law, and we think of it as a pipeline of interconnected pipes that begin with the police. They pass the material on to the prosecution service, the prosecution passes it on to the courts, and the courts pass on the uh, results of it to the penal system. And so there's this interconnected pipe that actually has to deliver law enforcement. And on the front end of it is the policing. And if the policing isn't working, then almost nothing good is going to come out of the uh, other side of that um, uh, justice system. But as you go along, you're going to move into the courts. And uh, here in, in the developing world, you likewise have severely broken systems. Uh, Alina's case took nine years to reach resolution. Um, 
What also we found is true that in the developing world, if you are a victim of crime and if you want your crime prosecuted, you have to hire a private prosecutor to do the legal work for you. The presumption that we have that you have a state prosecutor who will do that work for you is not an assumption you can make about the developing world. So if you are a victim of crime and you really want your perpetrator brought to justice, you will need to hire a private attorney to do that. But of course, if you're living off a dollar and a half or two dollars a day, uh, there's no way you can afford that. In effect, it, it, you've probably, if you're an average poor person in the developing world, you've never even seen a lawyer in your life. Um, in, uh, in, we were talking the other day about there are a lot of buildings in America where there'd be more lawyers in the building than there would be in the entire country in the developing world. Uh, Malawi, for instance, has about, I mean, uh, uh, Zambia has about 500 lawyers. Cambo Cambodia has about 500 practicing lawyers. Both these are countries of about 11 million people. So likewise, the prosecution service is then very, very tiny. It's overwhelmed, it's underpaid, and it's assumed that if you want your case prosecuted, you go hire a private uh, attorney. What makes this sort of worse in the Philippines and in, in places like uh, India as well is that the courts conduct their trials on a non-continuous basis. Uh, that is to say, if let's say you have a criminal trial in the Lena's case where you have a, a police officer who's on trial for committing a sexual assault against a, a child, that's maybe going to take five or six days of trial. Well, you will do one part of that trial at a time. So you'll have a day in which you might spend two or three hours on the case, then you will adjourn, and then you will do the next two or three hours of that case two or three months from now. And then you'll do the next phase of it two or three or six or eight months from then. So the non-continuous trial is also the, the dominant way in which criminal trials are done in India as well. Um, in many, many countries, uh, most of the developing world countries in which we're operating in, I would say now, are operating on a non-continuous basis. It's um, amazingly absurd uh, and when you ask of legal professionals like, why do you do cases on a non-continuous basis? Uh, the answer one generally gets is, well, we've got too many cases. And if we took too much time to do one case, all the other cases would stack up. But of course, if you have 10 books to read, and then someone tells you now you have 50 books to read, it probably doesn't help you to be told that you can only read them one chapter separately at a time, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing is going to solve the problem you now have. 50 cases, but the systems are overwhelmed and now they have mutated in the adaptations that actually make the situation worse. Many times what this is pushed by is actually that which profits the legal practice more. And in many of these situations the lawyers are actually paid by appearance fees and they just want to come and just appear in court and for them they will get paid. It, whether it advances the case uh, is, is much less uh, of a priority. Uh, there is also in these poor uh, circumstances no witness protection capacities for poor victims because uh, witness protection turns out is quite an expensive thing so if you have an under-resourced system uh, it's going to be very difficult to provide protection. Um, fascinating adaptations like in, uh, in Bolivia they've uh, tried to come up with a jury system uh, but what they have not come up with is a way to compel people to appear for juries. So. In cases in which that IJM works in Bolivia, we have to actually go out and find citizens and drag them to the court um, so that they will appear in trials. And so all of these things, what does this mean? It just all adds to the delay, endless delay. And what this does is it uh, undermines the, the credibility of the deterrent of any sort of criminal sanction because if it is delayed for years and years and years, uh, then it doesn't actually work uh, on the uh, community of people who might be perpetrators that they would actually feel a very significant deterrence. Uh, let me just go on the, with, with some of the other aspects of, without citing the, the specific stories, just what the, um, uh, sort of public justice system looks like in much of the uh, developing world. Um, 
Not only is it true that if you are a victim of crime, you will need to hire a private prosecutor. Also, if you are accused of a crime, you do not have a right to counsel. None is provided for you. So you don't get a sleepy lawyer or a drunk lawyer or a bad lawyer. You get no legal representation at all. And if you live in a country that is a former British colony, which is a lot of the world, it turns out, that uh, court system is going to be probably conducting its proceedings in English. And you are unlikely as a poor person to actually speak English, so you'll be appearing in a court um, with no legal counsel and uh, unable to actually understand the language in which the uh, proceeding is being conducted. Also, uh, in most of these courts also, um, I think some have visited Ugandan courts. Um, uh, if you go, uh, most of these uh, forums, there will be no third party recorder of the, of the hearing. Uh, the person who records the, the hearing is the judge or the magistrate, and they record it by hand. So two things that shows is that the proceeding cannot go any faster than the judge can write by hand. So that means if you're trying to make a point in front of the judge, you should not speak any faster than you think the judge can write. Yes? So do judges usually take like transcript verbatim notes no. or do they just like... They, excellent question. Do they take verbatim transcripts? No. What they do is they summarize what they think you've said and what they want the record to reflect as what has, has transpired. Which also means if you bring your witness in, your poor, scared, young girl who's had a very difficult and traumatic experience and it's been unbelievably difficult to get her to appear in court and she's got her big day in court and she's getting there and she's ready to say her little a story about what happened to her, but the judge has been given $5 to not really write down what she said, it never happened in court. Uh, so this is why it's important to have a third party uh, recorder of the, um, uh, of the proceeding, which uh, frequently uh, simply does not exist. Um, also, in, we, we looked at also the, the problem of the poor holding on to their land. Uh, for your average poor person, um, the greatest uh, vulnerability in many respects economically comes from losing any, any land at all a little patch of land in which you can put a little shelter and maybe have a, 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 some, some crops that you can raise to not only feed your family but sell for a little bit of cash. And if you lose your land, that frequently mean, means destitution. And most of the poor in the developing world will have no legal record of their ownership of their land. In fact, most of the land in the country will have no uh, actually documentable, uh, traceable ownership just because the massive system of land recordation has actually not been developed. Um, so what that does is it creates these e enormous ambiguities as to ownership, and whenever there's ambiguity, then it usually becomes a battle against the strong versus the weak, and uh, the poor end up uh, losing that, that fight. I could go on for more and more of these uh, descriptions, and it's worth marinating in a little bit because Unless you actually go, and this is what very few people have done, people are very familiar with the lack of fresh water in the developing world, lack of clean water or sanitation systems or food systems, or they know the schools are terrible or there's um, terrible medical facilities, but very, very, very few people, even people who are very sophisticated in terms of poverty in the developing world, very few will have ever spent a day in a court or in a police station to actually understand how these systems work. And these are, I think it's going to be quite clear as, as, as the world learns more about it, these are the most broken systems in the developing world. And occasionally this comes forward. In, uh, in 2008, uh, the UN uh, came up with a, 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 an attempt to sort of study this. 
and came up with a, a report that found that four billion people in the world live outside the protection of the rule of law. And the sort of stunning uh, conclusion of the study was this. Most poor people do not live under the shelter of law. Most poor people do not live under the shelter of law. They live in a state of de facto lawlessness. Now there are things, they're called laws on the books, and there's things called police, and there's things called courts, but they do not do the things that you and I would imagine them to be doing. In the developing world, virtually each component of the, this was the, the finding, Virtually every component of the public justice system, the police, the lawyers, the prosecutors, and the courts, generally diminishes the ability of the, of the poor to enjoy the protection of law. So what you have to sort of imagine is if you looked and traveled to all of the medical facilities and hospitals and so forth, and if those institutions all made people sicker, if they were institutions that did not actually improve health, but they actually undermine people's health. This is the general experience of the poor in the developing world of their public justice systems. One of the most uh, powerful studies of this was done by the World Bank um, in a, a massive study of 60,000 of the, of the poor called uh, Voices of the Poor. And I'll just quote one section of it. It says, a startling finding of the, of the report was the extent to which poor people experience police as a source not of help and security, but rather of harm, risk, and impoverishment. While there are some exceptions, in many places the police were considered a necessary evil, vigilantes, and criminals. In Nigeria, the poor associated the police with illegal arrests, intimidation, and extortion. In Bangladesh, the poor feared the police because of false cases they can bring, especially when the poor try to file cases against the rich. In Brazil, the police were rated as the worst institution. The poor said the criminals have public safety, we do not. In Argentina, the poor equated police to rubbish, while women felt vulnerable to sexual assault by police. And it goes on and on um, and on. Um, so, uh, you not only have systems that in many respects do not work and are utterly broken in terms of the effort of delivering uh, law enforcement for the poor, but they actually then are turned on the poor as vehicles of, of victimization. Uh, one of the pictures of just how broken uh, these can be is, is the Indian courts, again, which one imagines like India, well, that's one of the most you know, advanced economies that is just booming, unbelievable rates of, of economic growth uh, but what you have is sectors of hundreds of millions of people who are in many ways locked out of that uh, economic development because there's an absence of rule of law. We'll talk about how economic development happens in the absence of rule of law. But in, in, uh, in Mumbai, there is a 350-year backlog on the cases uh, before the Mumbai courts. And in Delhi, it would take 450 years to clear the backlog of cases in, in Delhi. So what I'd like us to um, spend the remainder of the time uh, discussing is just some ideas of why are these public justice systems so broken? And uh, why don't we, some of you have some experience with this, why don't we uh, begin to get some of those notions out on the table um, uh, as to why are, are these uh, public justice systems in in such a, a, a system, uh, in such a state of disarray, ineffectiveness in terms of uh, protecting the poor from violence. What are some ideas? Yes? There aren't really strong cultural norms about what the public justice system should do, because I think most people who live in that system their whole lives don't have experience with it, and so they don't demand it in the way that Weak cultural expectations about what a public justice system is uh, supposed to do and to be. In fact, the average poor person's experience of a public justice system is that it doesn't actually solve any problems for them. It just creates problems for them. So 
there's in a significant abandonment even of a vision of what a public justice system uh, might be. The idea of, for instance, officer friendly, who is going to solve a problem from you for you. If you're a poor person, you tend to, uh, first of all, you may have never seen a police officer who was not um, uh, corrupt at best and brutal at worst, right? So you, you don't run to the police to pro for protection, you run from them. So if that's your expectation, you're not even really going to be in a position to really demand much more because you don't even imagine that such a thing is possible. Other ideas? Yes? Just a lack of training and funding for the police yeah. to even have an encouragement to be not correct. Lack of training and funding, and why would there be a lack of training and funding? There's no expectation for it. Other reasons why there'd be no uh, training or funding for it? Yes. Okay, so go back, you said they were set up. So tell me about that. They were set up to serve people in power. Tell me about that. Well, especially in the case of India, which was a colony for a long time, the British brought in their own version of, a version of the justice system and kind of implemented it to essentially prevent public uprising and public uproar and uh, in some ways bring their own culture and their own ideas and then when India achieved its independence, it didn't do much. It was more of a changing of the guard <coughs> instead of a real change of systems. So you're telling me that the organizing documents of the public justice system in India, for instance, for the police and the courts and criminal procedure, the ones that are functioning in 2011, when were those written? 1860. Surely they have been changed. No, they have not. 1860, okay, so the British set up a policing system in the 1860s. Well, who invented modern, wonderful civilian policing in the Western world? The British. At, you go to uh, London and you have this wonderful experience with the Bobbies who don't even have weapons, right? They don't even have guns, right? They, uh, and the Bobbies, of course, came with um, Prime Minister Robert Peel, Robert, Bobbies. So this was the great invention of civilian policing in the 1830s. So what you have in, at home in Great Britain is you have the sort of incremental uh, extension of the franchise in Great Britain. More and more citizens are voting and participating. You have gr a gradual growth of democracy within Great Britain. And what you also start to see then in the 19th century is you start to see a uh, development of a police force that is then responsive to citizen concerns about crime. And so the British develop a wonderful uh, policing system for people living in Great Britain. But it turns out they're also ruling an empire. They also need policing in places like India. So do they go and they get the police system that they're developing in their own uh, country that is increasingly serving the needs of their citizenry and just put it over to India? No, they do not. Where do they go get their policing system model? Because everybody's just making this up, right? You got like, oh, I don't know. We're going to figure this out. What are we going to do? I know. One good ruler says, we just figured out how to do policing in Ireland, which has been running a rebellion against the crown, and so we know how to do policing that will put down rebellions, because we've also just had the Indian mutiny in the 1850s, and so let's set up policing that will prevent mutinies from happening and will not threaten British power. So let's import the Irish uh, constabulary and the Irish form of policing into India uh, in the 1860s, and that is the system of policing that still exists. Not only that, but then that was used as the model for British policing in the rest of um, the world in which it colonized. So actually, this would be a wonderful um, 
for those who are writing papers, a uh, uh, topic of going back and looking at what is broken in the public justice systems in the developing world, because almost all of it that is insane can be traced back to the fact that the, the current public justice system wasn't set up to work. In terms of if the goal is to actually serve a customer public to prevent them from being victims of crime, the legal and criminal justice system that is present was never set up to do that. And this is our experience in the developing world as you go into these various circumstances like, why isn't there a third party recorder of the uh, proceeding in this case? This makes no sense at all. Yes, it does. If what you want to do is prevent transparency of what's transpiring in your courts, because you actually want the magistrate who's an appointed uh, a colonial administrator to have complete discretion in those cases. You don't want public transparency. Or why is it that the Indian uh, police have never been trained? If you take the, probably the largest police force in the uh, civilian police force uh, in, in the world are the, uh, is the Indian constabulary. Uh, the average Indian constable has never received a single day of training in how to investigate a crime. Uh, they are trained in crowd control. So this is one of the uh, sort of primary, I would say number one, sort of surprise explanations about the developing world's public justice systems which totally, totally fail in terms of protecting the poor from violence is that they were never set up to do that job. And what happened is the colonial powers went home Largely authoritarian regimes took over control and they found these same systems really quite convenient uh, because those, these systems were for the purpose of actually protecting the ruling powers from the public rather than protecting the public from crime. And so what has not happened in, overwhelmingly in the developing world is any re-engineering of the public justice system so that it actually serves a customer public. What are some other reasons why public justice systems seem or would be failing quite so badly? Other notions or ideas? You can blame lots of things on, the, on colonialism and the failure to re-engineering, but maybe there's some others as well. Yes? The, uh, the lack of funding, which equals to a lack of um, personnel and just overworking of the police. So they're, they're frustrated and they're tired and the story that or, um, what we read from India, they were working sometimes 24-hour shifts, um, and you know, at most they'd have an hour or two of rest, and they were just they were irritable and anxious. Okay, so absolutely the case, and so then let's probe that a little more deeply. Why might they be so badly underfunded and so ill-treated uh, within the system? That is, the people are actually serving it. Any other thoughts as to why the public justice system should be so underfunded? Yes. Well, not underfunded. I was going to make a okay. point. Go back to your original question. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that colonialism had a lot to do with it. Yeah. Um, because it uprooted some of the traditional structures these societies had put in place um, to dispense justice. And, uh, and so I would say that you know, after reading books like Nelson Mandela's autobiography, uh, you have or had traditional leadership or village elders, for instance, uh, who asserted um, sort of the judicial perspective and societies have worked uh, for a very long time. And so I think in some of the rural areas, um, different parts of Africa, for instance, now, um, you might have more of a reliance on those traditional mechanisms that are still somewhat in place. And would you say, um, when you say that those traditional systems worked, how, 
what would be your general assessment of how well they work for everybody in those communities? In fact, would you like to live perhaps under what might have been a pre-colonial traditional form of, of justice system, do you think? Well, I don't think we've read anything yeah. um, that suggests that those systems were failing or weren't you know, doing what they were uh, set up to do, uh, which is uh, create stability in the societies at the time. I think colonialism is what transpired. Um, uh, but let's, let's go pre-colonial. Um, does anybody have any notion of what it was like to be um, uh, seeking vindication of some right or point of fairness in a pre-colonial justice system? What's your vision of how that probably worked? Um, it was probably, you know, a group of village elders mm -hmm. who decided, you know, I was in Uganda um, last year, and it was interesting because when we showed up, um, we had a group of I was meeting with the Bakwa people, mm -hmm. uh, also pigeons, um, or so called, mm -hmm. um, even though that's a derogatory term for them. And so they got into a circle, and this was sort of their you know, way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And you know, then they had one person stand up, and that person began to tell us what had happened to them. Mm -hmm. They had been evicted from their forest land, they hadn't been given uh, compensation or resettlement assistance. Uh, why had this happened? Why could they not go back? Um, and so we had two or three people that kind of spoke for the community and that told the community, you know, this is how things are going to go. If there's an ought um, against a neighbor, then that person goes to the village elder and, and it's dispensed with and everybody's comfortable with what happens and what they decide. Okay. Um, that's generally how it works. Okay. Yes, Ms. Vincent? Uh, I mean, I've not had that experience, but I imagine in some situations, Wherever there's money, there's going to be some form of power. And I think you go back and you see, you know, emperors, you see kings, you see people with land, uh, you see slavery. I mean, I don't think that going back before colonialism is going to fix all the problems. I think that one thing that colonialism did was to kind of centralize the power, and to centralize the resources, and then make that easier to subvert, make it easier for someone or some small group of people to unduly influence and unduly sway the public justice systems. I think the reason that, that things like this did work is because they were accountable to the communities, but I don't think that all justice systems before the colonial era were accountable to the communities like this. And we, it'd be interesting to have a whole course, really, actually, on pre-colonial justice systems, and it'd be really important, actually, for us to like reacquaint ourselves with some of uh, uh, the history, both that which was destroyed by uh, colonial systems uprooted, um, those things that are definitely, because there's now a movement increasingly to appreciate those traditional forms of, of justice, uh, rather than just sort of imposing Western models that aren't always the ones that, that work as well. But you also would have a, you're gonna have winners and losers in any justice system, because it's going to be an allocation of power. So whoever has power in that society, <coughs> things are gonna tend to work out well for them. If they have less power in that society, it's not gonna work out too well. So for instance, uh, women in Uganda would not traditionally have had any right to uh, inherit property. And so then that was something that uh, in the, just in the late in 1990s, right, women uh, in sub-Saharan Africa for the first time acquired the, the right to inherit property. So depending upon how things go, this could be positive for you or this could be less positive for you. But certainly colonialism brought a justice system which wasn't oriented at all towards protecting the, the poorest and most vulnerable from violence. But let's go back now to the question of underfunding for these systems. Why would they be so badly underfunded? Which is empirically true. Any other thoughts about that? Because doesn't everybody need justice, so why don't we pay for it? Yes? Well, I think in a lot of these countries, the um, structure is such that there's not a lot of taxes being collected. And I think, is in this country, taxes pay for a lot of our uh, public justice system. And without an efficient system with which to tax population or a population who can't pay taxes to begin with, you're not going to have funding for these kinds of services. Yeah, so there, it, many, much of the developing world has a difficult time efficiently or effectively um, uh, collecting tax revenues. Uh, but even you can find in the developing world, though, uh, public services that, relatively speaking, are decently funded. 
uh, and when they decide to prioritize it, it is, um, uh, can certainly be provided for in a way that is more effective than the public justice system. So why is the public justice system sort of extraordinarily poorly underfunded, you might think? It yes. It seems like, if, you know, a lot of the examples you've given where there's no guarantee of a prosecutor or no guarantee of a defense attorney, so it just seems to kind of carry over that well, we're not going to have any sort of post you know, law enforcement system in place, why would you fund the law enforcement system itself? Right, so if, you, if it's working badly, I mean, why have, um, uh, why fund something that you don't actually see w working uh, positively anyways? Yes? Well, and then the rich are able to use alternate means of protection, hiring their own security guards, and settling disputes through using corruption for their benefit. So there's no um, motivation there from up top to actually make it work for those that are poor. This is what I would say is like the second biggest explanation under uh, why public justice systems are so broken in the developing world. First of all is colonial systems that have not been re-engineered. The second one, second one would be that people of wealth and power in the developing world have abandoned the public justice system because they have been able to set up private substitutes for a public justice system. If you have money and power in the developing world, you do not rely upon the police to protect yourself or your, or your property. You hire private security to do that. Security, private security forces are, in many instances, orders of magnitude larger than the public uh, police force. Um, the, much more money is spent on, the, on private security. So those of you who've traveled in the developing world, like every little restaurant, right, has the guy with the gun standing outside. Uh, every house of reasonable size has a guard uh, at, at, at night outside. Um, so what, what happens is, at least for personal security, people with money simply purchase security uh, as, as a private transaction. Likewise for dispute resolution. You imagine that if you're doing business in India, that you're going to submit your disputes to resolution on contract matters to a court that has a 350 year backlog. You're not. What you're going to do is require uh, alternative dispute resolution systems. And so you are going to completely opt out of the court system because you're going to set up arrangements that allow you to resolve those disputes privately. So what this means is the, the, the vast uh, sort of whole world of economics and sociology of what happens when a public system is abandoned by the people of wealth and power in the community. What happens when the people with wealth and power stop going to the public school? Schools get crappy and crappier and crappier, right? What happens if those with wealth and money don't use public transportation anymore or don't use the public libraries anymore? Those public systems get worse and worse and worse. In fact, what happens over time, people with wealth and money don't even know what goes on in those systems. I don't even know what the public transportation is like in Malibu or something. I don't know because I've got a car and I'm probably not ever been on the bus. So I don't even, if it's broken and doesn't work and the buses don't show up, I wouldn't even know. This substantially is what the experience is for people of wealth and money in the developing world. They wouldn't even know that the public justice system doesn't work because it doesn't matter to them because they don't use it. Of course, that's one thing if it's the bus system, it's one thing even if it's the school system, that's really bad. But what if it's the basic system of law and order? The poor, of course, can't afford a private substitute and so they have to rely upon the public system, but they don't have enough, um, uh, they're so politically marginalized, don't have enough power and voice uh, that they're unable to bring about improvements. And so it gets worse and worse and worse. You have less and less and less investment in the system. Uh, third uh, reason that I'll just uh, mention uh, 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 quickly, uh, that is probably the biggest problem in the developing world in terms of bringing money and effort and investment to bear on the public justice system is that actually the people in power have figured out a way to succeed with a broken public justice system and they feel threatened by a public justice system that actually functioned well. Because what a public justice system does is it disperses power. It brings transparency. It brings equal protection. It brings due process. 
All those things actually diffuse power and give more and more voice, more and more power to the common person. And substantially in the developing world, uh, those who are in places of power have been able to get and enjoy that place um, in the absence of systems of transparency, in the absence of systems that actually bring equal protection of the law. And so there can be felt a tremendous sense of threat were these systems actually to work. Let me give you an example of a, of a piece of insanity. Uh, in, in Kenya, if you are a victim, at least in Nairobi, which is a city of about three million people, pretty good sized city. And that's a city that has um, about 150,000 sexual assaults a year, probably, uh, on top of the assaults that, um, uh, that, are, that are not sexual assaults. Um, there would be hundreds of thousands more. So you have hundreds of thousands of assaults every year in the city of Nairobi. Now, if you are a victim of sexual assault, one of the most important things for you is, be, is to get a medical exam, a forensic medical exam, so you can present that evidence uh, in court. Because a lot of these times, these uh, kinds of uh, 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 crimes take place without a lot of eyewitnesses, but that medical testimony is really, really powerful. In Nairobi, if you are a victim of, a, of an assault and you go immediately to Nairobi Women's Hospital and you get cared for and you get an exam and you have a doctor, actually be able to um, uh, do the exam that documents uh, the evidence of a sexual assault and you try to bring that evidence to court, or actually what happens if you try to bring it to the police, the prosecutor, since they're the ones who present it, they won't present that evidence. Why not? Because the doctor's not good or because it is incorrectly filled out? No. Because in Nairobi, the police and prosecution service recognizes that only one doctor in all of Nairobi can do a uh, medical forensic exam. His name is Dr. Kumau. And every victim of an assault must, if they wish evidence presented in a court, must go through this one doctor. Now, if you look, is there a legal reason for this? Is there something in Kenyan law that requires that? No. It's simply a matter of police practice over time. Uh, and prosecutor practice. Um, most prosecutors in, uh, in Kenya, for instance, actually are, are police prosecutors. They're not lawyers who've uh, been to law school. Uh, most of the prosecutors who present cases in the courts are policemen who are assigned to prosecution service. But in any case, a practice has developed in which on an average, about 600 people a day, if, if they were to make it you know, for their examination for even a sexual assault, would have to line up outside the door of Dr. Kumau, who is not actually well known for like great professional excellence, um, uh, to actually get uh, medical evidence presented before court. This is a, a matter of complete insanity, but why would something like that continue year after year after year after year? Why would something be so unattended to? Uh, significantly, the, um, uh, you'll find, I think, many of the answers arrive to that those who are in power in the situation would feel threatened by a broad access to these kinds of services because of the way it empowers those who are weakest. And that this will be one of the great challenges in the developing world is that those who have come to power and uh, and even to uh, uh, wealth in the developing world have done, been able to do so substantially in the absence of a functioning public justice system. And a properly functioning one is going to feel threatening. Uh, well, that's all we have to uh, engage uh, today. And so thank you all very much.